the final session of our conference, Infiltration Challenging Supremacism, and I'm happy to say that now we are finally speaking about uh, infiltration. <laughs> I think that we have been witnessing a lot of uh, discourse about different kind of methodology of participatory ob observation, of research, or um, understanding, questioning, and now we, I think, enter into the core of our event subject, so the discourse of infiltration and also mapping the international far right. And uh, this panel is with Julia Ebner, Patrick Hermanson, Christopher Schiano, and Hart Sacker, um, and is moderated by uh, Rebecca Pates, that I'm going to introduce. I'm really glad to have you here with us. Also, before having this uh, panel, we were doing a lot of interesting conversation uh, that also made me thought that I should have invited you to speak as well. <laughs> so I think that uh, I will keep this in mind for future events because uh, uh, Rebecca has been working a, a lot on this subject and uh, she is a political anthropo anthropologist at the Institute of Political Science from the University of Leipzig in Germany. And uh, she has been focusing a lot on the discourse of the theories of states and the organization of gender. Um, and also you did the deep study on the uh, East Germany and also the perception of being from East Germany. Um, so, I mean, probably you will come back here one day, <laughs> I hope that, to speak with us. Um, and uh, so uh, I just want to now leave the stage to you and thank you for being with us. Uh, this panel will be two hours and then at the end I will come back again for little announcement and also the closing of this conference. And I wanted to thank you all for being here with us. So this industrious and industri and, um, industrious panel um, consists of um, a whole number of people who are doing very exciting work, most of whose work you probably will have seen, heard of, or read already. Um, I will um, say just a couple of things about infiltration of um, the sort of organizations that we're interested in here before I will allow the first panelist, Julia Ebner, to give the first presentation. Um, just from a political science perspective, it's always interesting what people are doing when they're infiltrating. Um, and um, if I've read a whole range of texts, so let me tell you, there's a, there's a, there's a number of different things you can be doing when infiltrating. The, the activities can differ, the aims of the activities can differ, and the achievements can differ, of course. Now, um, the methods of infiltration um, range from, um, of course, complete concealment in infiltrating, or, but you can also be fairly open about it and just say, well, we are just interested in having a chat and you're writing a book about something. Um, the aims can be informing everybody else about what's going on in these organizations. It can also be to amuse. There's a very, very interesting uh, German infiltrator, um, Tobias Ginsburg, whom you might have heard about, who just wrote a book about infiltrating the Reichsburger. Um, that I, if you want amusement um, or edutainment, I can highly recommend. It's not so much informative as amusing, though. And the third aim, of course, of infiltration can be sabotage. Um, that is uh, working from the inside, and I think we had a talk about that yesterday. Um, one thing I would like to focus on, and I will ask questions about this later as well, is the sort of affects, the sort of po politics of affects involved with um, right-wing organizations. Um, we all know right-wing organizations as being probably as being hateful, if you think of what's been happening in Chemnitz of late or what happened in Charlottesville in the summer. So it's hateful, they're people full of anger, they're ugly faces. But um, one of the things that infiltrators can teach us is why these sort of organizations are attractive. Why are people going to organizations that look so hateful and angry from the outside? And what they give you, as becomes clear very quickly, they give you a sense of solidarity with others who are also full of hate, of course. Um, they also give you hope 
right? A lot of the narratives of the Wide Ring, and Julia Ibn has actually worked on this, a lot of the narratives are apocalyptic. People are extremely fearful of the future. They all think we are, the next world war is about to come, um, whatever the Jews or the, the West or the establishment are um, uh, preparing a new war and we have to defend ourselves. So it's also, it gives you hope to participate in this movement. It, and there's also a sense of love and um, comradeship. Um, but maybe what is actually most startling to those of us who just see the faces of hate at first is that there's also, it's a very lustful movement. There's a lot of lust involved. Um, there's a lot of, um, people are very engaged in their hatred and in their fear. And it's, it's, it's a very exciting movement to be in. And I think we should not underestimate how attractive this sort of lust is, the lust in being scared collectively and hopeful collectively. So. Um, these are the sort of things that we can only understand if we read or um, see the works of people who actually engage with these movements which have sometimes in the media such ugly faces. So um, I think it is a great honor to have here our first speaker, Julia Ebner. Julia Ebner is, um, has become very well known this summer in her book that in German is called Wut, Was Islamisten und Rechtsextreme mit uns machen. It's actually a bestseller in Germany. The English variety I found in, um, in airports, in airport bookstores. I think that's a real claim to fame if your book is sold in airports, yes. <laughs> So, Julia Ebner is actually, I've bought your book several times now. <laughs> it is extremely entertaining, um, but not just that, it's also informative. And she actually explains to us w how they recruit, how um, Al Qaeda and IS and various organizations succeed in recruiting us, what makes them attractive, what narratives, what discourses, what affects make them attractive. And I s hope that she will give us an insight into some of her findings this evening. Welcome, Julia. We're very much looking forward to your talk, and you have 25 minutes. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. I actually didn't realize that the books were sold at airports. I have to check this out when going back to London. Um, yeah, this was, I mean, so far really fascinating. And um, what I would like to do now, are the slides up? Can I? Yeah. Yes? Oh, great. Um, what I would like to do now is kind of to walk you through a journey of um, different infiltrations that I've done within the course of my research. And before I do that, I'd like to just tell you a bit more about my motivations, because as you said, there are various different motivations that can um, lead to such, such kind of research. For me, it was really, there was a turning point for me because I was working, when I started this research, I was working for a think tank based in London, um, more on countering Islamist extremism and jihadism. And my former colleagues were actually uh, themselves uh, former Islamist extremists. And I'd seen this rise in, in Islamist extremism um, across Europe, the waves of terrorist attacks. But then when um, Joe Cox, the British Labour MP, was stabbed just shortly before the Brexit referendum happened, to me, that really was a turning point where I thought um, I also have to focus actually a lot more on um, understanding far-right extremism better and also understanding this intertwined relationship between Islamists and far-right extremism because they have a lot in common, which is what my book is about, but also because they have been reinforcing each other and in a way what we saw after in the aftermath of Islamist extremist uh, terrorist attacks was really a rise, a surge, a renaissance of the far right across Europe, but also um, across the US. And so these, um, these different terrorist attacks inspired by far right ideologies, by hateful ideologies, uh, really led me to, to want to understand them from the inside and want to understand how, what their strategies are, how they're trying to um, take these from the very fringes into the mainstream, because I thought that was the most dangerous thing that could possibly happen, that they would actually get into politics, which is unfortunately uh, in some, in, I mean, happening increasingly across Europe. I'm sorry, oh, yeah, I will, I will do something else. Let's try this. That's probably better. Um, yeah. So here on, on the slide, you just you can see a few of these examples out of uh, various um, um, examples just across Germany, the UK, and, and the US, and other European countries where far-right extremist attacks have become increasingly common. 
And what I started doing was I first wanted to really understand better um, where the far right, um, basically what, what kind of language the far right used, what kind of cultural references. We've heard a lot now in the last, in the, in the last presentations, which were incredibly inspiring. But I, I figured that in order to really understand also the motivations and the whole culture that is behind that, I needed to learn kind of the language that they were speaking. And a few just really the, the top lines of this, I mean, they use the Matrix or Fight Club uh, very commonly in their language, um, using, for example, the concept of red pilling coming from the Matrix, uh, taking the red pill and seeing the truth all of a sudden. But there are lots of other concepts that I found very, in a way, also very fascinating. Um, so I spent a lot of time on, on different uh, far-right channels online. And maybe to just um, kind of to tell you a bit more about the infiltrations that I was doing, I was uh, doing a mixture of online and offline infiltrations and mostly undercover, so completely concealed, um, rather than being open about it because I figured that coming from a counter-extremist researcher perspective, they wouldn't be very willing to, uh, to speak to me. But, um, yeah, so, and I... I actually started setting up online um, identities, very various different avatar accounts, because I was also trying to get into different, ideologically very different groups, actually. Some of them would be very, um, very neo-Nazi, kind of really old Nazi um, school uh, movements, and others would be more part either of the alt-right or even part of the counter-jihad movement. So I also, um, for example, infiltrated the English Defense League and uh, generation identity, which would be more the new right or kind of the old right, the European old right equivalent. So that took some, some time and some thinking um, because obviously, as always, it's, it's quite difficult to, to kind of build up uh, a completely new um, identity and to make, uh, to, to make all the connections. So um, for example, on Facebook, it wasn't really possible for me at least because it takes, I think, years to really build up a credible Facebook account. So I did mostly, uh, what I did was mostly use Twitter, but then also use a lot of the alternative tech platforms that were, uh, where I could benefit really from, in a way, I could benefit from all the removals that had happened during that time, where a lot of the far right leaning accounts were, uh, were removed after Charlottesville and in the summer of uh, 2017 especially. So I could easily say, oh, I shared um, a Merkel meme that, was, um, that, let me, that let Facebook to shut me down, for example, and they would believe me, and I could say, oh, but I have uh, a Gab account, which is kind of the old rights Twitter equivalent instead, so you can, you can find me on there. So that was um, what I did in the beginning, and yeah, I frequented, I started frequenting all these different alternative tech platforms, that were created, sometimes created right after Charlottesville. Some of them had existed previously, but they were really set up in a way for, for the purpose of creating a safe haven for, um, for a lot of these uh, far-right extremists. And to better understand also the way that their mindsets work and the way that their communication works, but also to get in touch with some people. And there, as you can see, there are social media platforms, but also, of course, alt-right um, crowdsourcing platforms, for example, Hatreon that was set up um, instead of Patreon, or even alt-right or alt-dating platforms like Wasp Love, um, which is a scary place. <laughs> Don't go on there. It's, it's absolutely terrible. I've been um, exchanging messages with a few of those people, and it's really, it's, it's, it's exactly what it says. It's a place, if you want to date, reformed, Christian, cribbleful, confederate, homeschooled, Christian identity, white nationalism, alt-right, or sovereign grace singles, then that's the place to go to. Um, but there are also others. There's also, I think it's called uh, white singles. There's also Trump singles or something like that. So there are various, or yeah. There are various of these alternative tech platforms, and there's almost, it seems like there's almost a whole alternative universe, an alternative information and news ecosystem that has taken shape. And that is actually really interesting to study because in a way that's all part of this, this counterculture movement or several different, of course, subcultures that we just heard about in the previous uh, presentation as well. And I think it's interesting how they all interact and form part 
in a way of a bigger network and how they operate completely sometimes in parallel to, to the platforms that we would be mostly um, used to. And then I had to get vetted for a lot of the online um, groups, the ones, especially the encrypted, um, or the, the groups, the private groups that were on the encrypted apps. Um, Discord, we're going to hear a lot more about Discord later, but it's basically a gaming application that is very commonly used, that has been kind of co-opted by alt-right and far-right groups and movements. And so I, for example, I, I did go into a lot of the Charlottesville organizers channels or the alt-right channels, but I also went into um, a lot of their European uh, kind of equivalent channels, especially for, by Generation Identity and um, the troll army, the neo-Nazi or very extreme right um, troll army, Reconquista Germanica, and, and also into some American neo-Nazi um, groups that actually some of them required me to send, for example, a full account of my genetic ancestry to be accepted or to send them a picture of my wrist um, to prove that I'm white or things like that and to do, for example, voice chat interviews where they would ask me um, about my ideological leanings but also about my sexual orientation, my um, yeah, kind of literature preferences. It could reach from pretty much anything to um, from the genetic questions to the, the cultural questions, for example. And, yeah, and then um, I also sometimes um, really wanted to speak to them in person because there were certain limits that I reached when, when doing this online. So I, uh, that was already two years ago, I joined um, the English Defense League for uh, their event in Telford. So I went to a rally and to speak to them directly. Um, it was a rally against what they would call Muslim grooming gangs. And that's just, that's just one example, so that's more the counter jihad kind of movements. And then I also went, that was one year ago now, I was recruited into Generation Identity or the Identitaire Bewegung. Um, they tried to set up, or they did set up, a UK and Ireland branch. And they came to London for that, to speak at the uh, Traditional Britain Conference. And I had actually been in touch with some of their Austrian uh, members or leading members and was then invited to join them in the pub after that and then also to join their kind of official or their, their secret um, meeting in an Airbnb in Brixton, which was a really strange situation, sitting among kind of 20 white nationalists and discussing the strategy for how to best launch their uh, British offshoot. But what was interesting was that they spoke a lot about um, media strategies, how to deal with, the que with tough questions they get from journalists about are you anti-Semitic, are you racist, things like that. Um, they also spoke a lot about the ideological foundations, a lot about the Nouvelle Droite um, kind of ideologies and, and also about their selection procedures and how they would want to, in order to have a good branding or to focus on optics, they would only want to have educated members and um, would want to have a certain kind of quality in their uh, membership, which was, yeah, was really interesting to see how that, um, I can tell you more about this later in the Q&A, but this was, um, all these experiences were, I think, interesting because they also shaped the research that we've been doing um, because they allowed me, for example, for Generation Identity, but also for the, the online groups that I infiltrated, allowed me to predict some of what was going to happen. So they, in a way, informed my research because we were monitoring, for example, the, um, the Charlottesville rally and all the hashtags that were sh shared around it, the communication strategies in the, I don't know, two, two months or at least six weeks run up to the rally. And, um, of course, some of this also had some very um, kind of unforeseeable consequences. So sometimes when we published research or also when, when I wrote articles for The Guardian or for The Independent, I had a bit of a backlash from the far right because obviously they don't like it if they're um, being talked about uh, in a negative way, of course. Um, or if they're, if basically if their uh, strategies are being exposed. So when I published an article mentioning the English Defense League founder, Tommy Robinson, he ended up coming to my office. That was back when I was at uh, Quilliam 
the think tank that I worked for previously, and he actually came or stormed into our office with a cameraman filming me or filming the whole confrontation and live streaming it to uh, Rebel Media, a far-right or far-right alternative news outlet in Canada. And this triggered a whole chain effect of reactions because he has a huge followership. So he's, because he is the founder of the English Defense League, but then also founded UK Pegida and um, does a lot of these media stunts. He had, I think at some point, 300,000 followers. And because it was taken up by that, um, by that rebel media news outlet, it also triggered a chain effect among other, a chain reaction among other far-right or alternative news outlets globally. So Gates of Vienna reported on it, Richard, uh, sorry, Robert Spencer and Pamela Geller and their Jihad Watch and their whole news network reported on it. And then also, um, yeah, for example, Breitbart also wrote an article. And they often completely dissected my whole life and would pull out interviews that I did years ago or even my master thesis from my, my studies in China and completely try to find things that they would be, that, they, that would allow them to either embarrass me publicly or discredit me in a way. And so that was quite, um, an, I think, to me, a surprising and also shocking moment when I realized how much you could do with online data and how much you could intimidate um, a political opponents or people who would criticize you. And, but it also was interesting because it was the first time that I really saw not just from the research, but really personally um, experienced this interconnectedness of different, uh, of these different, basically these different groups and these different media outlets and these different far-right networks. So that led me to um, do a research project together with my colleague at ISD, Jacob Davy, and we tried to really map the whole, um, this interconnectedness of the different far-right media outlets, different far-right groups, and we found, um, so we analyzed uh, 5,000 pieces of content and did a lot of linguistic analysis, but also studied the networks um, with our uh, social media monitoring tools. And one of the main things that we found, and this was, um, this was already kind of mentioned a bit, so I'm not gonna go too much into details here, but was really their mainstreaming strategies by creating uh, compelling or interesting or inspiring countercultures by using humor, satire, transgression, and often by co-opting pop culture. This is something that ISIS also did, um, of course, and where they've been also very successful in creating, in a way, a movement that would appeal to young people and uh, to these youth subcultures on the internet. But yeah, also the way that they staged media stunts which is then also exactly what I heard in these um, internal meetings at Generation Identity, how, they, how much they thought about the whole process of, of um, staging these, these explicitly for, for the traditional media to pick up on it, but then also how they could trigger um, traditional media outlets to report on them by staging uh, online campaigns that would go viral and in a way force the mainstream media to report on it or how the, how the Charlottesville protesters um, were thinking for weeks about how they should dress and even told some people uh, who they said might not have an appealing outward appearance, um, kind of urged them to stay home if they thought they weren't handsome enough, basically, to make a good impression. So how much they thought about optics and about um, how to present themselves publicly, but also the use of gamification in their propaganda, in their strategies. So, for example, they would also use computer game references like God of uh, Race War, the picture that you can see that was used by Italian fascists who tried to paint the Italian terrorist um, Luca Traini, who did, committed the attack against uh, African migrants just in the run-up to the Italian election. They tried to paint him as that kind of hero of the computer game. And, of course, also memetic warfare and how that's all gamified. Yeah, we also, this is exactly what um, really confirmed the whole, this chain reaction that I talked about in the, in the media reporting about the Tommy Robinson raid in my office. Um, we found a lot of cross-border mobilization and collaboration, usually around certain uh, rallying points, like events like the Charlottesville rally or like Defend Europe, uh, the 
uh, the campaign that was launched by Generation Identity in the Mediterranean to um, kind of prevent refugees from being rescued um, off the coasts. So um, there was on the one hand this cross-border collaboration, but also increasingly and um, probably even more shockingly, there was also a lot of collaboration between movements that would traditionally not really get along because they would come from very different ideological corners. This is where I think Char Charlottesville has been a really interesting example of, of this. But now we're also seeing a bit more of a splintering again of these different um, groups. But it is interesting that around events, like around Chemnitz now, like around events that would, uh, in a way, bring them together on the basis of their lowest common de denominator, they would find common ground and they would try to collaborate for the sake of having a bigger impact. And they also adopted their messaging to the different target groups that they wanted to reach. So they're on the fringe platforms, like the Daily Storm, it would be very explicit. They would speak about the, very openly about their anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. Whereas on some other platforms, they would rather uh, focus on other more common or grievances that are more common among the mainstream, like fears related to Southern heritage in the Charlottesville case or um, anti-left rhetoric, or kind of the focus more, was, was really more on culture than on race sometimes. And after we published this research, there was another wave of threats and, and also um, doxing and harassment that my colleague and I, or my colleagues and I experienced. And this also taught me a lot about their perception of, of women because a lot of what was targeted at me um, was, I mean, deeply mis misogynic and really, um, it was interesting because my colleague, I think, received a bit less uh, of the threats that I, than, than I received and I think it showed really the overlaps also with the manosphere and with this anti-feminist uh, movement as well. But yeah, it's, it, it was, um, it, it taught me a lot about how they used intimidation strategies to really try to now silence not just journalists, not just political opponents, but also increasingly researchers. In the US, I think professors have become increasingly also targets of such campaigns, especially also doxing, where they leak their private address or the address of their families, the phone numbers, um, which is also what Generation Identity, for example, um, tried to do. In my case, yeah. Um, I'm not sure how time-wise because I don't have a clock on here. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so this, so after, after these new waves of threats, I was also interested because it seemed like the whole universe was against me because on social media, it just, um, it almost created the illusion in my head that um, there was almost no supporter left or that really I had done something wrong and because there was so much hate that it kind of took in all the space or it seemed to me that it took in all the space on, on social media also after the, um, the raid with Tommy Robinson happened. So I, that led me to do another um, research project in collaboration with um, Ich Bin Hier and um, which is a, a German um, activist group that, um, kind of, or they're, they're a Facebook community that uh, counters hate speech and especially hateful comments below uh, news articles on Facebook. And um, that, that really, I think, increased my interest in understanding where all this coordinated hate was coming from and how they managed to really often create the illusion that they represent the majority while actually a lot of this hate online is coming from a very small minority. And this is exactly what our study um, found. Uh, we found that only 5% of all active accounts of, for example, the hateful comments, the likes of hateful comments below news articles that we were analyzing came from, uh, oh, sorry, over 50% uh, of these comments or of these likes of the comments came from only 5% of people. So really a very small but very loud minority of people that were dominating the whole discourse and the whole, um, in a way, could frame the way that um, political debates were, were set and could frame the, the discussions online. And sometimes they were also then amplified by bots or by um, media outlets, sometimes also Russian media outlets that we found. And when matching 
this finding with kind of the insights I gained into this Germany's biggest trolling army, uh, Reconquista Germanica, which at its highest point counted, I think, 10,000 members. On the, day of, and on the day before the German election, they counted 7,000 members. And their goal was to influence the German election in favor of the AFD by doing mimetic warfare, by staging online psychological operations or campaigns, uh, using also yeah, memes and jokes to hide some of their extreme ideologies behind funny, um, funny images or visuals. Uh, and when matching these findings with, with what I found in Reconquista Germanica, it was interesting because a lot of these accounts, um, because what they did basically was really coordinate hashtags and coordinate times, for example, so, so that they could trick the algorithms into prioritizing their posts or so that they could create viral campaigns or make things um, really dominate the whole social media discourse by having very clear orders and instructions. Um, for example, they had very clear hierarchies as well, as you can see. So their supreme leader, um, Nikola Alexander, he would, for example, give an order uh, to tell everyone to dislike a certain pro-refugee campaign, for example. And because of the whole, because this would be completely coordinated, they would manage to get into the top um, so their, for example, their hateful comments would appear in the top section or they would be able to really hijack some of the hashtags uh, because that was, there was such a high degree of coordination. And they also used some of um, what's actually even been written down and outlined in Generation Identity's Media Guerrilla Warfare Manual which uses also a very militarized language, so they would speak about sniper missions to target political opponents and intimidate them. They would also speak about raids or bigger, kind of, um, bigger operations, but all in a very militarized language. And again, very gamified in a way, because they always speak about the virtual battlefield and electronic armies. And especially in the context of the, the German election, it will be interesting how this plays out now in the Bavarian election, actually. But at the moment, Reconquista Germanica server is down, at least. But before the German, um, German election last year, they were um, quite successful in spreading some of their topics and in actually making politicians and media outlets pick up on their, on kind of their, comp on their themes and frame the discussions. And some of their hashtags were trending in the, in the top, were in the top five trends in the two weeks uh, run up to the election. And they also had lots of, they even themselves evaluated and analyzed how they were doing and would then celebrate this and sometimes be rewarded, for example, to be so especially successful um, kind of, um, generals or, or soldiers would be promoted into higher levels. And the promise was always um, this would then reflect, be reflected in, in real world hierarchies once we manage to establish our own vision of how the world should, should function or once we get into power. So there was a very um, clear element of gamification but also of real world connection to it because they could see that they would have an actual impact not just online but also, uh, also offline. Um, just to say a few more words uh, about the general context um, with the next few elections that we're facing. And I think especially um, looking at the whole trajectory or the whole journey we've been through since Trump was elected, I think what we've increasingly seen is kind of an ecosystem that repeats itself or a playbook that the alt-right and now also the, the European alt-right or the European far-right increasingly uses um, that this, this pattern is really reappearing and we've spotted similar tactics, similar vocabulary uh, among the, the European far-right groups, among the campaigns for the, the German election, but also the Italian election, um, even the Austrian election to some extent, and before that, a bit in the French and the Dutch election. But right now there's also tomorrow, there's the Swedish election happening, and um, of course, there, there are the European Parliament elections that are happening in 2019. And it is um, quite concerning that 
the far right seems to have learned from the alt-right operations in the US that they can be successful and that they can um, have an impact through their online operations. And Steve Bannon with the, the movement, I think will be an interesting case to look at with the European Parliament elections because he is someone who would, um, as was mentioned previously, believe in the value of culture for, in, for influencing um, how politics, uh, how poli which, which course politics take and that politics is downstream from culture and by empowering these different subcultures or these different far-right groups that frame themselves as uh, countercultures there could there is at least a potential for him to really be a chaos agent in the spread of disinformation in the spread of memes that go viral that would intimidate polit politicians or journalists and anyone who voices criticism so I think um, there's a lot that yeah, also needs to be done in the months to, to come and maybe an inf infiltration is, one more infiltration is needed here. I think I'm not the right person to do this because now they unfortunately know me, even what I look like with a blonde wig, so I, I, can't, I can't go for that option anymore. Maybe I would have to completely change my, my appearance for that, but yeah, <laughs> thank, thank you. you for, thank you for that super um, <laughs> talk. So I'm sure we all have lots of questions, but um, we are going to hear all the speakers first, and then we're going to discuss details with them. Um, so our next speaker, thank you very much again, Julia. Um, uh, our next speaker is um, Patrick, Patrick Hermanson. Patrick Hermanson is also here from London. I forgot to say that Julia came specifically from London to talk to us, um, as is um, Patrick, Patrick Hammerson, a lot of you might have seen him already because he's been at articles about his amazing infiltration of various um, right-wing organizations have been in the mainstream media with little um, movie clips attached where he's talking to all these people I only know from my readings and from the video clips in which you appear as well. Um, that, uh, and it, he was doing his PhD in a quite a different topic at the same time, so I found that particularly impressive that you spent a year um, all the while talking to interesting people on the far right. So um, thank you very much for being here, Patrick, and we are very interested and looking forward to hearing what you did, why you did it, and what the upshot was. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so I work for an organization called Hope Not Hate. Um, it's a British anti-racist organization with we aim to combat far-right extremism um, in as many ways as possible. So this is, includes the extreme right, uh, which is what I do mainly, but also um, kind of this shift towards more support for um, radical right-wing parties. And we do this through education, polling, and campaigning um, for voter registration, for example, um, but also inf infiltration. Um, because we need to understand this threat, that's the basic idea. And then infiltration, just like polling, uh, are, are two ways to do that. Um, so in 2016 and 17, starting um, in the fall of 2016, um, I joined um, a London-based uh, organization and then traveled through um, many other related organizations. Um, so it's a, a single infiltration, really, that lasts for a year. Um, um, they started in London, but ended uh, in the US uh, with Charlottesville and, and everything after that. Um, so this organization that we saw um, was uh, international in its scope. It's, it's a conference, mainly, very much like this one. Actually, they, it brought together people from all across the world, all across of Europe, um, North America, uh, but also beyond that. Um, uh, we had, uh, they, they, they have contacts with people from Japan, and, and it's, it's extremely international. Um, and it's also secret, and that's uh, what it built its uh, success on. So um, to get in there, you needed to be vetted, uh, background checked, most often, um, and, sorry. or you needed somebody to vouch for you. And they even, they even called it a safe space. 
Uh, so talk about appropriating language, um, which is interesting in itself. And, and this is, of course, what, what draw people to come there. So these people that otherwise kind of enjoyed uh, engaging in far-right extremism, um, the alt-right and so on, uh, behind this safety of anonymity, um, could keep doing that while, while coming out uh, in the real world, uh, which there is definitely a drive to do. Um, and since there were so much people coming to this place, uh, we were worried about a possibility for it to, to unite the movement more broadly, um, but specifically in the UK. Uh, it shouldn't overestimate this possibility. It's been tried many, many times before and never really worked. Um, but we really saw kind of a wide range of far-right parties uh, and groups and individuals going to the same thing. So um, we had people from the alt-right, like Greg Johnson um, and, and people around Richard Spencer, but also more extreme people like Heimbach, um, who's in the picture there, and I was also in touch with them. But it was also part of uh, the kind of people that had left the Tory party, um, coming from the ex extreme side of that. And at the same time, National Action, a prescribed terrorist organization. Um, and they also lacked um, any kind of social media. It's not a social media organization. These still exist and, and they do play a role. Uh, so this is what kind of warranted infiltration. Because infiltration is not always warranted. But in this case, we thought it was. Um, so I made um, my first contact with a person called um, Stead, Stead Steadman, which is actually a real name. Um, and we exploited the fact that he was a Scandiphile. He, he loves Scandinavia and Sweden, uh, where I'm from. And he was learning Swedish. So he needed a Swedish teacher. Um, <laughs> which, and I speak Swedish. So that was a great match there. And I was also... Um, of course, um, I, I name myself Eric because it sounds very Viking-y. Um, and then I built a backstory, of course, um, about coming to London um, as a um, kind of politically interested university student starting to study there, uh, escaping the left-wing bias of, of Swedish universities. Um, and now I came here, I was inspired by Brexit, and in London I could be myself. It was a bit of a um, gay story. It was, it, it's just like you come to the big city to be yourself. That's what was my... I, I am gay, and I, I, and I really thought about that story myself. Like, I can very much use that. I can go to the big city, this, in, in this big anonymous city, I can be my true self. And not gay, but a fascist. And it worked. <laughs> And it, per <laughs> it worked perfectly. Uh, and of course, then I started meeting with Stead. And, and one of the issues with infiltrations, a practical issue with, with the method, is that you can't ask too much questions. Um, it's, it gets suspicious. This is a paranoid movement that we've been reminded of all, all, all the time. Um, but me being a, a language teacher helped me basically sit there for, for hours on end and just talking with him. And you need to talk about things and, and to, you need to fill the time, basically. Just like in school, you would talk about um, your family and your interests and your favorite food. Uh, with Stead Stedman, it was um, national socialism. Um, but the same thing, really. Um, and from there, um, Stedman happened to be... Oh, no, I should give you... I, sh I should give you a little clip first to kind of show you what, what, what these, uh, some of the meetings they, they organized were. So this is one of their more fancier events. Um, so you can get kind of a grasp of what type of organization this is. Um, this is one of their secret events. It's not a great it's for me to be picture. Standing here when sitting in this room are uh, more than a few of the key players in this, uh, this great game that the winds of history have precipitated. So please, um, can we hear some more of it? Thank you, Greg. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, 
What happens in a world of unbounded nihilism to different nations and races? Well, without boundaries, there's nothing to stop people from mixing and flowing and ebbing uh, around the globe until all borders, all distinctions are gone. What happens to racial differences? Well, if life is all about consuming and getting and enjoying experiences, you have a, there's, a, there's a great advantage if you don't have any qualms about uh, with whom you mate or date, right? Uh, getting rid of any boundaries in that area uh, increases your, your choices, increases your options as a consumer of pleasures. And eventually, if any, any offspring happen to be conceived, what you'll have is a, is a sort of homogenized brown humanity that the United Nations uh, uh, wishes to create. We need to mainstream this stuff, or more precisely, we need to bring the mainstream towards us. So, so that was kind of a, that, now you have a bit of a grasp of, of how these people are thinking. Um, and they also, and that kind of you saw the type of event, it was a very, um, it was basically a dressed up dinner. Um, and this is how they met often, uh, secret hotels and, and that sort of thing, um, that they book under a different name um, and then invite people from, from all over the world. So that was uh, Greg Johnson who runs Countercurrents, who is one of the main, uh, one of the important sites. Um, and Stead Steadman introduced him there. So by becoming friends with him, I, I gained trust with the rest um, as well. Um, that connected me um, and, and, and we also realized how connected it was because we had underestimated that. Um, Stead was more central than we thought um, and, and this organization was even more connected than we thought. So this is some of the organizations I was in during that year. Doesn't need to tell you very much. Um, and it's really interesting is what, what role this type of organization plays um, nowadays. Um, people talk about the uh, post-organizational far right, where people engage online and, and spread these, um, engage in these campaigns. Um, they kind of see me independently radicalize um, and, and, and are organized, but only online, behind this veil of anonymity. But these organizations, and there are many of them uh, actually, um, they play this role of connecting um, different groups and different organizations um, this is where you come and, and you introduce yourself um, and have a friend in common with a person. You get introduced and then you get um, asked to come to another place. Um, you share ideas um, and in some ways also funding. Um, there's also talks about money and ideas, but mainly ideas. And it's really important. Um, because this trust you built at this organization travels incredibly well because these organizations are part of a, of a bigger ecosystem um, where um, they consume the same media and, and they produce it themselves, of course. Um, and this trust then allowed me to, to travel on within this network um, to other groups, in, in just in, in London, because there are many network, there are many different groups, um, but also the U.S. later on. Um, And I want to talk a bit about the, the, the social aspects of, of, of this movement, but also about infiltration. We're supposed to discuss infiltration as a method as well. And I really want to um, I agree a lot with what you said. Um, the social aspects of these groups, uh, we cannot never underestimate that. I spend probably 80 to 90% of my time in purely kind of social events. It's, it's about having a beer. Uh, talking to people about everyday life. Um, and it's, it's, they meet several times a week, so there's a, a very high volume uh, of contact you have with them. Um, and if it's not this organization that you're primarily uh, a part of, there's always another one that is around the corner and does similar things. Um, so there's always a cause f for, for meeting like-minded people, and, and these organizations just fills this kind of basic need of social contact for a lot of people. Um, and it's quite clear because people move between different organizations that are quite contradictory in, in 
in what they do. So people could go to a pagan ritual in the morning and then go to mass the next day. And, and you see those things all the time. Um, I talk with people in the, in the back of meetings sometimes and we just look at each other and shake our heads um, because it, it, it completely disagrees with the previous meeting we were at. Um, but you're there for the social aspects. You're there because your friends are there and you're there to make new friends and you're there because you don't have anything else to do. Um, this is, of course, one of the hardest issues to solve because it prevents you from leaving. Because this is combined with, with other important part of, the, of, of this life. It's that these organizations are incredibly hostile towards the outside, everything outside. Um, the left, like we said, but, but it's also just general people that don't disagree with them. And in addition to the important things you said in the beginning about a positive uh, comradeship, which there definitely is, it's, it's, it's completely vital to understanding these groups. People go there and, and, and enjoy themselves. You do hate on things, uh, but you support each other in, in, in the perceived repression of yourself. Um, so they are angry, but they, they feel a camaraderie and support in, uh, in these groups and with each other. But then, in addition to this, uh, which we can't forget, is the, is the conspiratorial part, um, which we haven't touched so much on, on in this conference this far. Um, but these groups are incredibly conspiratorial in, in every direction you can think of. Of course, there is the um, fascism conspiracy. Is conspiratorial ideas are um, have all been connected, of course. Um, Anti-Semitism is, is, is vital. Uh, and, and these people, um, they are Holocaust deniers. Stead Stedman doesn't He's a, he's a very outspoken Holocaust denier, for example, and so are many others. People uh, laugh when you start talking about the Holocaust. Uh, it's portrayed as, they, they call it the biggest PR event uh, in history, uh, because they allowed the creation of Israel and, and so on. Um, and this conspiratorialism uh, extends to other things as well. I mean, this, this is chemtrails. Um, it's general things about left, it's, it's an anti-Semitism, uh, it's anti-Muslim ideas. Um, it just goes on and on. We have heard many of them and, and some you have never heard of and you, they, they, they were probably made up by that person who will never hear about them again. Um, but to be part of a group that are bound together by conspiratorial ideas um, is incredibly exciting if you believe them. Um, so you're part of this group that have, um, have seen behind the curtain. You've seen the um, secret, you've understood it, so you, are, you understand more than the rest of the population. You have access to, to secret knowledge. That is incredibly uh, attractive, simply. Um, that, that's, that's definitely something um, that people um, like about being there as well. Um, and people share these ideas and, and they are discussed widely and at length. Um, and some of them are not particularly um, hateful, like anti-Semitism and those um, types of hate. Um, like chemtrails, for example, that's it's kind of an, not a super important conspiracy theory. It's about the trails coming off of airplanes that are there to make us politically passive. Um, but those discussions are uh, really discussed every day, all the time. Um, so I really want to stress those things. Um, it's important to bring that in as well. Um, but then next to this social thing is, 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 of course, the question that we often get, and that's about you being part of that. Yeah, because um, th it's quite different uh, depending on how long you do your infiltrations, of course. Um, I was there for a very long time um, and met very intensely with a few people. And um, that helps in understanding this greater context. And that's one of the things that makes infiltration a valuable method, <coughs> I would argue. Um, but it, of course, puts a strain on yourself. Um, 
and now it's echoing. Um, there is this issue of, of, of uh, how much um, connected can we be to these people, how, how much empathy and so on do we get, um, which I think are really valuable discussions to have. Um, it is complicated, to be honest, and um, people portray it as a, as a negative thing that we could then support them, actually, or you can turn. I think the, the possibility of that is minimal. Um, it's not going to happen because you're there for a very specific reasons, so you have specific goals and ideas, and you, you, have a, you have a no political conviction, and you put these ideas in context. The ideas themselves are not going to just convince you all of a sudden. It's rare. <coughs> but um, to have these uh, close connections could then potentially um, mean that you would support them, people ask. Um, which I think is um, ridiculous. But then, uh, or indifferent, we portray them better outside. Um, but I would argue that this is one of the most, the strongest sides of infiltration. Um, there are narratives nowadays where we, we discuss uh, far extremists as monsters. That's, of course, a very simple way of describing things. Um, and, and I disagree with that. By being part of these groups, we, we can understand people to a very deep level. Uh, and what we're doing is still immoral. Uh, it, it's ugly. We need to recognize, maybe, um, that infiltration is a quite an ugly business. You exploit people's trust um, quite extensively. It's, of course, I, I can definitely um, justify it by, by what, what it achieves, and we need to be uh, clear with that. Um, but to recognize infiltration as kind of an ugly business um, is important, I think. We shouldn't romanticize this, and, and we don't need to, I think. Um, but to see that, um, then to, to see that it is a bit ugly and to remember that um, allows you to be um, humble and not go too far and not to be ruthless, basically. And that's really important in creating this film that now is coming out and has come out in some countries is that we expose quite few people. We expose, expose the top layer. Um, and that's very conscious. Um, we want to expose those people that radicalize people that are dangerous, that can actively bring these ideas forward and, and grow these organizations. But the rest are there for all the reasons I've told you before. Uh, and they are absolutely uh, horrific, many of them. Um, but there is a possibility for them to maybe get out and reform. And we need to give people that possibility. I think that's a very central idea to, to everything that Hope and Hate does. That these ideas come from somewhere, um, and it can go in different directions without defending them. <clears throat> so, kind of the result of this was, of course, I will cover this briefly. I don't have so much time. The infiltration in this case, I, it led to um, the closure of London Forum. Um, this is the kind of the exposing and, and sabotage uh, aspect of it. When I came out, um, uh, we did a big article in the New York Times, and then the idea of me having been in these different groups started to travel around, and they understood it. And what happened then is, of course, that people started to point fingers. Uh, they started to point fingers, and the, you, you exploit this kind of um, paranoia within the movement itself. Um, and then things start to break apart. So you break relationships between different groups because they don't trust each other. Um, and that was a conscious decision. And that is the very anti-fascist, not a research part of this project. So London Forum is not active anymore. <coughs> and some people left, they all tried to write after. There was a lot of reactions to it. Because um, I did quite a few things. I also spoke at a forum, um, and I vetted people. That's so why I did those background checks sometimes. So all of those people can't be trusted either. Um, and it shows that this method of exposure is quite effective. Um, we did stop this organization, um, and it looks like it's not coming back anytime soon. And with that, we stopped the ability for, for other people, because you do get radicalized on the inside as well. 
you don't get completely radicalized and then join. You do get self radicalized to, to a degree, and, but then you join and you get even further. Um, and we can stop that for some people. Um, and we, most importantly, we, we raise the cost of, 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 of doing these things. That's what infiltration and, and ex, or rather exposure is about, to raising the cost of fight activism. That is maybe the core of, of my work, to raise the cost of far right, uh, of engaging with far right. Because that's how we keep people out. Because um, people rely on their anonymity and so on. And, and, it, uh, and it stops them from, from recruiting. Uh, because the recruiting process then needs to be much more tighter. Um, and that uh, ties, uh, stops it from, from growing quite effic effectively. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, again, that was a very interesting presentation. We're now moving from London to um, across the pond, but not altogether. <laughs> um, we're, um, uh, as I said, Julia and Patrick were both located in London. Um, one of the many sadnesses involved with Brexit is that amazing organizations, like the two organizations you guys work for, are not going to be in the EU anymore. Um, hopefully, great research is still going to be done on Europe from the UK, but we'll see about that. But there's also amazing research being done in the US. Um, we now have two guests um, who are working um, for or with an organization called Unicorn Riot. Um, if, if I understand it correctly, neither of you are actually doing infiltration work, but you're working as a journalist and you're working as a programmer. Um, so, um, very briefly, um, uh, Christopher is, um, is uh, working as a journalist and he's here from the United States. And Jack, also known as Heartsucker, is there's a very interesting blog about um, looking at what's going on in Chemnitz and uh, similar um, continental events on uh, your blog, which I'd like to recommend to anyone interested in this. Uh, it's uh, called heartsucker.de. Um, Pardon? .com, sorry. Okay. Um, but they're going to give a sort of joint presentation on two different topics, um, both involved with Unicorn Riot. So I'm very much looking forward to your presentation, and thank you for being here. Hi. Um, yeah, so I'm really glad to be uh, here in Berlin with everyone. Um, thanks to Disruption Network Labs for inviting me. Uh, so... Yeah, my name's Chris Schiano. I'm a journalist with an independent media collective called Unicorn Riot. Um, and just sort of, I guess the briefest introduction is about a year and a half or two years ago, I didn't really know anything about the alt-right. And then uh, some of us went to Charlottesville and then really quick we ended up uh, sort of being in possession of and becoming a clearinghouse for uh, really large amounts of private uh, alt-right data. And so I'm going to try and um, go over some highlights and share some of the insights uh, that I think we found from that. Um, just a quick introduction to Unicorn Riot. We were founded in 2015. We're an educational nonprofit. Uh, we mostly cover protests and social movements, things like Black Lives Matter. We made a free documentary about uh, the struggle against the Dakota Access Pipeline in North Dakota. Um, we've leaked some ICE manuals, covered uh, protests against ICE. Um, we're totally non-commercial, we're completely audience supported, and we release everything under a Creative Commons license. Um, and so I think everyone here sort of knows what we're getting into, but some of this stuff is, I don't know how harmful it is, but it's not great for your mental health. So I just like to always keep that in mind. Um, and so myself and uh, two other of our reporters were traveling to Charlottesville. We sort of had a sense that it was something we wanted to be there for. Um, we didn't really quite know what was going to happen. Um, about an hour or two outside of Washington, D.C., uh, or driving to Charlottesville from D.C., one of our reporters was contacted by someone who said, hey, there's this thing called Discord. It's sort of a chat program. They're using it to plan the event. We've got recordings of their meetings and some of their operational documents. Is this something you would be interested in? And we were like, holy shit, oh my god, yes. 
Um, and so we learned a lot. Uh, we listened to an audio recording of one of their planning meetings. It was facilitated by this guy, uh, Eli Mosley. His real name is Elliot Klein. He was one of the main organizers of the event. Uh, and we learned about the torchlit rally that was planned that Friday night. Uh, we went there, reported on it, uh, did our best to conduct some interviews. Um, we were assaulted. Um, the next day, we also attempted to interview some white supremacists and were assaulted by uh, white supremacists and the police. Um, but it's, we're not really here to talk about that. Um, we're here to talk about Discord. So this is one of the documents we received and read on the way to the event. They're sort of talking about um, doing counterintelligence against counterprotesters. They have this very militaristic language they're using. They have like a command structure. Some of them are veterans. Uh, some of them were active duty military at the time. And uh, yeah, we learned about the Torchlight Rally. Um, and on, on this audio call, and we're listening to this uh, on our way to the event, they just talk about Discord a lot, and I didn't really know uh, what it was, but uh, pretty quickly we'd be learning a lot about this program and trying to get to the bottom of uh, what Discord is for the alt-right and sort of the, the role it would play, or has played. Um, so Discord, um, does, it, does anyone in here have a Discord account? Just show of hands, people use it. So it's mostly marketed to gamers. It's kind of like Skype. Um, it seems like really good software. It certainly worked very well for them, at least until uh, certain things happened. Um, so it has a really large user base. Uh, it's really favored by gamers. Um, it's, it's really ideal for these groups to recruit. Um, you can, sometimes you can click an invite link and you go straight into a vetting room where people are there to just ask you questions and try to recruit you. Um, the company now has a policy against neo-Nazi content, but they don't go looking for it. If someone finds it, you can report it to them, but you have to get like the channel ID numbers and it's, it's very technical. So I would say the company has a somewhat good stance, but uh, they, these things are by default allowed to exist on their platform. Um, and uh, doing some research immediately after Unite the Right, uh, according to the Southern Poverty Law Center, which is a nonprofit that tracks a lot of hate groups, um, they describe Discord as having a monopoly uh, on far right movements. Um, and that seemed to sort of explain uh, things that I wasn't able to understand at first. Um, and so we learned some things through Discord on the way into town. Uh, we were pretty tied up with our on the ground coverage that weekend, and then. I want to say it was Sunday night. I was in bed in my hotel and suddenly shot up out of bed at 1 a.m., remembered that this Discord thing was still there and was like, oh, I should log in and check this out. And was just like, oh my God, there's just mountains of data here. We need to preserve all of this. Like this is a historical body of really intense evidence. And so uh, I didn't know what else to do. So I just took screenshots with the same hotkeys for about six hours until I had to go to sleep at about 7 a.m. Um, and then a few days later, uh, another one of our reporters who wasn't in town with us found a way to um, use a JavaScript tool to basically suck all the data out of a Discord server. Uh, a chat room on Discord is called a server. You're not operating your own web server, but it's like on, on Discord's uh, web servers. But it's your own room and you can administrate it. Uh, and so I knew immediately that we wanted to sort of replicate some of the earlier WikiLeaks releases, I'm not really speaking about recent WikiLeaks, but like the Chelsea Manning stuff, you know, the good stuff. Um, we really wanted to make this available, but there was some challenges with, uh, we had to make redactions and stuff. But we were pretty quickly able to share some of it with some larger media outlets um, and just get the fact that these Discord conversations existed and, and really implicated a lot of people and provided a high level of uh, detail and insight into these groups. And so um, we were able to get that into the national narrative pretty quickly, um, and we were pretty glad about that. Uh, this is one example of, of sort of the details that we unearthed. Um, this was made by a group based in Detroit, Michigan called the Detroit Reich Wings. It's sort of an informal group uh, with representatives from different neo-Nazi groups. And so this is a shield wall tactic. A lot of the violent footage of street fights in Charlottesville you can see these guys in helmets, and uh, they'd have shields and poles. And um, so here they're describing that they basically based all of that off of riot police training. And uh, I didn't make slides for it, but we have a lots, of, lots of examples of people would post selfies of themselves with their shield, like with their stick. Sometimes they'd have like little nails in it. And then you can watch the footage and be like, oh, that's him. There he is. Uh, another thing that was really stood out very quickly was um, 
I'm sure most people are aware of the car attack where James Alex Fields uh, drove his car into a crowd, uh, murdering Heather Heyer and uh, injuring a bunch of other people. Um, these are just a few examples of posts describing, um, like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we drove cars into our political opponents, the anti-racists who we know are coming to protest us? Uh, on the left, we've got a screenshot from, I want to say it's the Dawn of the Dead, some zombie movie. Um, so this guy's saying, this will be us. And uh, this guy, his name's Alt Selt. He's really, um, his name's Shane Duffy. He lives in Chicago. He was a member of the Traditionalist Worker Party. Um, this guy on the right, he uses the alias Tyrone. Um, a lot of these people, they like to use uh, stereotypically black or Jewish sounding names kind of as part of their uh, parody tactics. And he's um, basically telling people that he thinks it's legal to run over counter protesters if they're in the road. Um, and from another chat server, we found someone saying, I feel like someone's gonna die at, at Charlottesville. And so that seemed like an eerily prescient comment. Um, and yesterday we heard a little bit about sort of the lone wolf and leaderless resistance tactics that are encouraged uh, among the alt-right, among white supremacists. And so I thought this was a really good example of that because they're sort of putting it out there. None of these guys did it, but someone picked up on it, it seems like. We don't know that James Alex Fields was in Discord, but um, I would put it at at least 50% odds that the Department of Justice has that, and uh, you know, maybe we'll find out. Um, and then immediately after the car attack in their Discord server, on the left, I had to redact this because it's all a bunch of doxing stuff. Um, they misidentified the driver through some sort of like license registration thing, and they were saying this guy was a leftist, he killed his own people. Um, so they were spreading, I think they knew it was false and they were spreading and that was also coming out of 4chan and a lot of other places. Um, and then this guy on the right is uh, in the car, that's Sam Hyde, he's an internet comedian that's pretty popular with the alt-right. It's been even long before Charlottesville, anytime there would be a terrorist attack or a shooting or some sort of incident involving deaths, they would say that Sam Hyde did it. It's sort of a meme that uh, they get a kick out of and spreading misinformation. Sometimes reporters will pick up on it and think it's true. Um, another thing we found in their discussions in the lead up to the event, um, uh, yeah, like we heard earlier, they had, they're really concerned with optics and uh, I think Charlottesville was sort of an optics disaster for them, but they were still trying to have it be, you know, a good visual moment. Um, they talk about, they sort of prefer, this is like a grayed out version of the American flag in the top left. And then uh, in the bottom left, they're saying, I can put this on my bumper without being investigated for a hate crime. Uh, but that but the, they consider it a hate symbol. And then um, here on the right, we've got uh, Jason Kessler, who was the Charlottesville organizer of the event. He's basically telling people to make people think they're with the Proud Boys, who are basically, they're considered like a soft core white supremacist group, but they're not like full-on Nazis, or they say they're not. But so he's saying to get people to think they're with them so that they can frame themselves as, as like victims or something. And then he's saying, uh, wear your MAGA hats, like those red Trump hats. Uh, if Antifa fucks with us, it'll look like average Trump supporters are under attack. So they're really uh, concerned with trying to create this victim narrative for themselves while also uh, openly preparing for violence. Um, and this is something that recently came out. Uh, Bellingcat is sort of an online research investigation group. They found, um, they did an analysis of 2,000 Discord posts that we published. Uh, of them, of the, the Nazis talking about law enforcement, and they basically found that some Nazi groups really support the police, other Nazi groups um, think that they're revolutionaries and they want to fight the police, but they all are sort of unified by this understanding that manipulating the police is in their interest, and um, we've seen different incidents in the US that that seems to be a somewhat successful strategy. Um, I think there's also a local example here in Germany of, uh, you know, far-right members of the police force leaking information. Um, so at first, we were just publishing screenshots. Um, it was a pretty brutal uh, workload, just going through. I would publish a batch of maybe four or 500 at once. I'd have to crop them all to remove our source's username. Um, we'd also have to manually redact those images for uh, doxes and stuff like that. Um, but then uh, some volunteer developers really hooked us up and made this tool where we could take the JavaScript data and then reassemble it in a publicly viewable database. 
And uh, this quote at the bottom here, I think, uh, is pretty lucid. Um, this guy is Thomas Ryan. Uh, we're going to hear more about him later. He's uh, the leader of Patriot Front, which is like a rebrand of Vanguard America. Um, and he's saying here, some commies will run JavaScript on chats and log all the messages, tens of thousands, and upload it all into a database somewhere so that if anyone ever feels like doxing you, they can look through everything you've said and comb through it until they've got something. <laughs> And so uh, Unicorn Riot doesn't dox people. We like publish information. We're not like listing their home addresses and their family members and stuff like that. But uh, I just thought that was an interesting comment. They seemed to sort of understand uh, what was starting to happen with their information. <laughs> uh, and so the first group whose Discord server uh, we put into this uh, publicly indexed searchable database is Anticom. It's short for anti-communist action. It's sort of a not so subtle play on anti-fascist action. Um, it's not really a formally organized group. They would sort of talk like they were organized, but it was a mess. Their server is mostly just shit posting. But it did, uh, and they would present themselves as like, we're a variety of right-wing people who oppose communism. But really, the people that were claiming to be their leaders and like acting in the name of this group were, we could document that they were actually national socialists. Um, some of their chats included manuals on how to make explosives, um, and they also had membership in common with the Adam Waffen Division, which is a US neo-Nazi terror group that's uh, implicated in several uh, murders. And one of them is about to go on trial, I think. And I'm pretty sure he's got Discord stuff on his phone. Um, and so this guy, uh, his name's Seth Vitko. He is based in the Charlotte, North Carolina area. I had no idea who he was before I read these Discord logs, but he kept coming up, and he really seemed like a really important person to me. Um, he presented himself in the Charlottesville planning discord as the anti-com head representative. Um, in a podcast appearance of his I found, he described uh, wearing full body armor and having an assault rifle in vehicles that were used to drive around people like Richard Spencer in Charlottesville. Um, and he also talked about Dylan Roof, who shot and killed a bunch of people at a black church in America a few years ago. Um, most of these people really like Dylan Roof. They consider him a saint. Um, they call him Saint Roof. And he said, if I was going to do what Dylan Roof did, I would uh, you know, go find where the surveillance cameras are and make sure I got away with it. So, th so this person is someone that I noticed and became very concerned about. Um, and he later joined. He's been floating between different neo-Nazi groups and uh, trying to join the military. But I don't think he got in. I'm not sure. And so this is another screenshot from Anticom's Discord server. Uh, and a book I found pretty helpful in sort of understanding this stuff. It's by an anti-fascist researcher named Alexander Reed Ross. Um, this principle of the fascist creep, which is basically how fascism as an ideology or as themes can sort of spread beyond the fascists themselves by insinuating themselves into more mainstream right-wing discourse. And so this meme here, in private, in public, basically says it all. Um, the yellow and black is more of a libertarian anarcho-capitalist aesthetic. Uh, Anticom would try to say they're libertarians, um, but I mean, yeah, there, there, there you have it. Um, one of the next groups we exposed um, with reports late last year and earlier this year is Patriot Front. Um, they're a rebrand of Vanguard America. There was sort of like one of the lower ranking leaders basically stole all the organizational infrastructure. Um, and so this is sort of a clip of Thomas Ryan, who uh, sort of seemed to understand what we were doing with Discord leaks in that quote earlier. Um, this is some audio we got from their Discord planning chats that um, one of our sources, we've had many different sources, I guess real quick about infiltration. I haven't really infiltrated these groups personally. I have a few SOC accounts I've used for some of our research, but basically Discord leaks is a collection of data and material from different infiltrators who have approached us and um, sort of sought out a relationship with us to make use of their data. And so this is... Uh... Thank you. <laughs> and so the little intro here, we, we were like, we've got this audio leak, how do we want to present it? And I was talking to another one of our journalists and we both sort of appreciate some kinds of like new wave aesthetics and, and industrial music and we're like, man, the, the fascists are really running with this and sort of taking it as their own. And we thought a, a cool approach would be to sort of take that aesthetic and associate it with this Discord leak stuff that we know uh, they find somewhat concerning. So uh, 
this is Thomas Ryan from Patriot Front describing um, the aftermath of Charlottesville. The night uh, after Charlottesville, the night after, like the, the literally, the bodies are still warm. The Heather's ha Heather Hare's body is still jiggling after the impact. Um, <laughs> and uh, it had this, I don't even know if it's stuck yet, but it was definitely still going. Um, it was a big podcast, Asmodor's podcast, from the crypto world with Eli, who is now losing race, and, uh, and Faith Goldie, who lost her job, and, uh, and who else? Christopher Cantwell, who's now in prison, or who, he, he was in jail, and now he's free. Now he's free, my mistake. Um, and uh, who else was there? There were lots of folks there. I was there, um, you know, importantly. Oh, and also the entire DS crew was there. Good guy. Um, anyway. So I was sitting down next to Cantwell and other people, and it was kind of like, oh, man, this is awesome. Um, and uh, then Eli, Eli Mosley, says, uh, but we're supposed to be quiet because um, the podcast is being recorded. And he, like, leans over and shows his phone to me. And he's like, have you seen this? And I see it's, uh, it's James Alex Fields standing in a shield wall next to a bunch of VA guys with the VA stuff on, the, on their, you know, logos on their shields and hats. And I was like, oh! That's bad. <laughs> this is a PR nightmare. Um, so we have a bunch of little clips like that. We have like hours of audio from that group. And so um, basically one of the reasons they started Patriot Front is because the Vanguard America brand had been compromised because there were so many photographs of James Alex Fields with them. And so they're basically fine with what James Alex Fields did. You know, they were laughing about it, but they're um, still finding ways to like avoid liability and consequences from being associated with it. Um, and just some other insights from Patriot Front in particular. One of their members, um, he uses the alias Machine Smiter. He started the College Republicans Club, or claims to, at Roosevelt University in Chicago, and explicitly said, I'm starting this College Republicans group to recruit people to white nationalism. Um, also, Patriot Front uh, sort of rebranded as like American nationalists. Like, there's obviously Nazis when you look at them for a few minutes, but um, they wanted to be able to recruit right wing people more easily. And I think correctly understood that using patriotic imagery is the way to do that. Um, also, Andrew Anglin of the Daily Stormer sort of freaked out after Charlottesville and was like telling people they needed to be more careful about their optics. And basically, Patriot Front uh, embodying the American nationalist approach was sort of like their chosen group. The Daily Stormer would sort of shame a lot of other Nazi groups, but like, they had a really good relationship with Patriot Front. Uh, this was another quote I found really illuminating of their strategy. Basically, um, yeah, this guy, Racist Milk, is saying, uh, patriotic American imagery, something true Americans identify with and plausible deniability for us when associated with Nazism. Um, so one of the next groups we exposed, basically for several months I was lurking, uh, not through my own infiltration, but through someone else's, um, in both the Traditionalist Worker Party Discord server, who we're about to talk about, and Patriot Front. So it was like, I don't know, it was a lot going on, it was, it was kind of intense. Um, so yeah, TWP is the Traditionalist Worker Party. They were started by this guy, Matthew Heimbach, who was one of the more high profile leaders of the white nationalist movement until, um, a certain love triangle basically destroyed his career. Um, and so they're different from Patriot Front. They consider themselves like insurgents. They don't like America. They think America should be destroyed. Um, and they're more, I don't know, they consider themselves revolutionary national socialists, I guess. Um, something we found in their Discord servers that they weren't as public about, um, they were visiting people in the Charlottesville jail who were uh, arrested for beating DeAndre Harris in the parking garage there. Um, and they also started appropriating uh, anarchist and leftist rhetoric around supporting political prisoners. They started um, claiming that the white supremacists who were arrested in Charlottesville were political prisoners, also that Dylan Roof is a political prisoner, and encouraging people to put money on their commissary, uh, write them letters, and they actually were sharing how to write to prisoners guides from leftist groups like the National Lawyers Guild and the Anarchist Black Cross. And uh, sort of along those lines, this is Matthew Heimbach in an All Cops Are Bastards shirt. Um, I don't think he's wearing this shirt ironically. After Charlottesville, they sort of started to be like, hey, we still want to manipulate the cops, but like, they're not our friends either. And so I think they were genuinely trying to use this rhetoric to reach people, but also looking to taint anarchists in the left by association with themselves. And so, yeah, this is him in what I think is an anarchist shirt doing uh, 
I'm not going to say this is a white power hand symbol, but it's a symbol associated with white nationalist groups these days. Um, this was another really interesting exchange. Uh, so in March of this year, Richard Spencer had his last campus appearance in Lansing, Michigan. Uh, the Traditionalist Worker Party and Patriot Front were both there uh, sort of trying to attack counter protesters having these high profile street battles. Uh, and what they're talking about here is apparently if what they're saying here is true, um, they were staying with Richard Spencer at his rental property and were paranoid that anti-fascists were going to attack them, so they started manufacturing Molotov cocktails, um, which is like an explosive device, and uh, they talked about that in, in Discord. Uh, and so this guy, Corey Smith, uses the alias Dr. Coco Puff. He's like, yeah, I, I made those Molotov cocktails with tiki, tiki torch fuel. And so this was uh, pretty interesting when I found this. I was like, wow. Uh, and then they deleted it, but uh, after we had captured it. Um, and so also, basically, I had been, this was sort of anticlimactic. We were in the Traditionalist Worker Party Discord server for many months, taking notes. I was hoping to basically do like this journalistic takedown of their group, and then they self-imploded due to like, the number one leader had an affair with the number two leader's wife, and then the number two leader who ran all their infrastructure deleted all their infrastructure uh, because of the, the affair. So. <laughs> that was a little, uh, I sort of felt like they stole my thunder. <laughs> but that's just what happens, I guess. And so, uh, how are we doing for time? Okay. Um, and so, I'm just going to do a few examples of people that have been exposed from Discord. I'll try to wrap it up here. Um, this is Brian Brathov. He was one of the primary security coordinators for Unite the Right. Uh, he talked with the police a lot preparing for the event. He was active duty National Guard at the time. Uh, he's since been ejected from the military, I think. Um, this guy was in a Vanguard America Discord server. We don't know his name. He used the alias Nate the Great, um, and he bragged about getting hired as a prison guard. Um, the Huffington Post was recently able to confirm that uh, the Department of Corrections had him resign. And then uh, this guy posted as Tyrone, talked about running people over. Uh, he was also a US Marine. Uh, he was ex we didn't expose him, but it was based on Discord logs we published uh, without naming names. The person that gets credit for that is uh, here with us today. And uh, happy about that. Um, and so this guy was also in Patriot Front. His name's Jacob Zach. He bragged about his uh, weapons collection joked about getting raided by the ATF, uh, and then was raided by the ATF because some of his weapons were illegal. Um, and so that's just a sense of, there's a lot of other people. Um, check out the ProPublica reporting and uh, the PBS documentary, uh, Documenting Hate, um, to learn sort of more about the process of exposing these people. And uh, these Discord logs are being used in civil litigation. We didn't provide them, but they're still being used as evidence in court and uh, subpoenas are being served uh, directly to the Discord company itself. Uh, the lawyers for some of the car attack survivors have identified at least 30 users who uh, are in Discord and participated in the rally and they believe are, are liable. Uh, we found a Canadian Daily Stormer admin, or we didn't find him, other people found him, gave us the logs. Uh, so his stuff's up there in our database now. Um, and recently we dropped logs from a South African alt-right Discord server uh, connected to the Proud Boys that's uh, pushing this white genocide rhetoric using uh, falsified crime statistics. And they're sharing Hitler memes and using the same language as the alt-right in the US, which I think really highlights the international nature of the phenomenon. Um, and we've been getting a lot of other leaks, not from Discord, of like Facebook Messenger logs and videos from internal Proud Boys Facebook groups. And so. Basically, um, the only reason I'm not still going through thousands of screenshots and crying about it is because uh, hackers and developers stepped up, helped us create a platform to index and make sense of this data. And so I think this sort of phenomenon of like, we've got all this data, what do we do with it? Who can help me make use of this data is that's gonna keep happening. Uh, if more journalists and hackers can have relationships like that, I think we'll have uh, better results. And so um, if you wanna check this out, discordleaks.unicornriot.ninja is where the database is hosted. If you're researching any Nazis in the US, uh, there's a good chance we have something on the people you're looking for. Um, and uh, Heartsucker is one of the people that helped us with this, um, and so he's gonna tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, so kind of the, one of the really important parts about this is that we had people who were doing infiltration, and by building a platform that allowed us to expose them in a very user-friendly way that took the work they were doing and any possible risk they were taking by doing this work and really like 
maximize the payoff from this. And so when we started developing this, um, we wanted to be able to give a quick overview of kind of everything that was going on. And so on like the left side, we have just like a list of all the servers plus all the channels. And we allow people to do a free text search of everything that's logged in there. And also, this talk isn't super technical. If you want to ask me like hyper technical questions, we can do that later. This is kind of general consumer. Yeah, anyways. So when we have the list of servers, you can see there's here Anticom, and they have the uh, room general, and they have another one called uh, rules and pastebin. And there's a second copy of that. Same thing with front and center. You can see there's the general channel repeated a ton of times, because they would delete the channels thinking they were hiding and removing information. But it was stuff that people had logged already. Um, additionally, next to the channels, we show counts of how many messages that channel has to help people who are jumping into this get an overview of maybe what's important and what's not important and kind of help them get their heads around this a bit. I would do the same thing with users. We index all the users and like show how many users have which, user, um, which messages attached to them. Um, for doing free text search, this is probably actually the best way somebody could dive into this because if you know that there's somebody from your hometown or your you know, local racist fascist group, you might know some keywords that'll help you find if any of them are in the chat or any of the topics that they really care about are there and can help you kind of narrow in on what you care about. Because right now there is about an, a million messages in, the, um, in this server, or sorry, in the like, Discord Leaks platform. And that's way more than somebody can go through in a reasonable amount of time. So here, as an example, for Seville, you can see there's a handful of people. And we do see, again, Eli Mosley talking about this. And it, you know a lot of the messages are just quite boring and just like shit posting trash, but there is also legitimate planning that happens in some of this. Um, also, we show because users can appear in multiple servers and will be in many channels. Um, this is Vasilis the Greek, whose real name is Vasilis Pistolis, and he was a US Marine who got kicked out of the Marines for participating in the Unite the Right rally. And this is just him chatting in uh, a couple of channels related to Charlottesville 2.0, which was what was Chris was talking about. Um, currently, like, he was reported to have left the US and joined the Greek fascist group Golden Dawn. Um, and again, this is another, just a, another quick view, sort of showing them chatting about um, the night of the US election where Trump was elected. And it's, this is um, Zeiger, who also was outed by Montreal anti-racists, um, talking about you know, them going to a bar full of normies to um, like make fun of them when Trump wins. Um, so really quickly on the technical note of what Discord leaks looks like, it's just one server we have, like medium powerful, and we took a bunch of different um, like applications and shoved them into you know containers to have a nice, happy, isolated environment. And basically we have like one little web server that routes traffic to one little Python application that and all the, the data right now is indexed in Postgres, and we use a Redis cache to help speed up page load times because some of the stuff, like the server can get really, like um, not overloaded necessarily, but some of the like operations on it are kind of heavy. So like this was a massive optimization from like the original Discord leaks when it came out a long time ago. That's really like helped us get a lot of stability. Um, that's it for the technical stuff. The end of this is like the key takeaways is that when you're doing anti-fascist, anti-racist work, or you're doing journalism, or you're doing like data investigations or whatever, you actually do need like infrastructure to perform these things. And so, like this is kind of like a call to action, like from my behalf towards the like other hackers in the room. Like go find your local anti-racist groups, and like they probably need stuff like this happening. Like they probably have tons of information they've collected. They probably have tons of photos, and they probably have like. Oh, there could be ways you could help them turn this information to something more usable and more searchable. And another thing is once you make things more usable and searchable than maybe just like a blog or somebody's Twitter feed, you help disseminate the data in a more consumable way that makes it more actionable for the next journalist to come by. So like, you know, if I was a journalist looking up, you know, racist groups in the US, I'd have to go follow every single anti-racist and anti-fraud Twitter and then like troll through all of, like troll through all of them to like collect all this data again, and I would basically be redoing the same amount of work they'd all done themselves. But instead, if you can build a good infrastructure, that like means you do extra work, but nobody else does any work to get to get this stuff done. Um, and like, there's some like cypherpunk amazing pipe dream I think of where you know a whole bunch of different anti-racist, anti-fascist groups and journalists 
all have some like decentralized network where they can share data among each other. And you know, when like I am able to take photos as like a journalist, uh, I can post them and share them with like the local anti-racist groups I trust, and they can you know I'd maybe use those to identify like different you know police officers or like hospital workers or like even people with like you know normal day jobs and whatnot. And you know, it's, we're a long way from that, and it's not going to happen anytime soon. But like. The long-term thing is building infrastructure really helps with this, and sharing information is good. So, like, you know, y'all should work together a, a bit more, and if you can, so I'm going to end this with a meme because you know the right loves memes and fuck the right. So, who would win, a bunch of Nazis or one leaky bay? <laughs> and I think that's it. So, these are some email addresses if you want to talk to us. Um, and done for now. Thank you. That that sounds like really amazing work. Maybe um, I'm I'm allowed to ask the first batch of questions. So here we go. I start with you guys. Um, how often um, does the um, does uh, the the Discord network get pilfered? Um, is it was it just a one off like in the summer, or do you actually get continually new data? And why don't they um, prevent you from doing that? <laughs> um, there's a. I'm not going to say it on like a video broadcast, but there's a publicly available, very easy to use tool for extracting data from Discord servers. Um, and just our, I think the main innovation on, on our part, thanks to the volunteer developers, was being able to host that. Um, so we got a batch of maybe five or six servers um, from uh, the Charlottesville source, where we got the Unite the Right planning chat. And that basically. Um, us being trusted with that and then that source not getting burned has led to lots of other people that maybe were already in these groups or infiltrating these groups sending us data. Um, also, there are some Discord servers you can just find publicly. There's ways to find invites, and sometimes there's an invite link. People forget that they left somewhere where you can find it, and then you can go find another one from that. So there's. Um, I've, we've had, I'd say, at least a dozen sources. We've found some stuff on our own, and there's also lots of unpublished. We have, have at least uh, over, well over 100 servers, and we've published maybe, I don't know, 10. So there's, there's a lot. Um, and how, um, how does this, um, this amount of information get turned into journalistic articles? Do, do you do that yourselves? Uh, do, you, do you point journalists in a particular direction and say, look at that cash or look at that uh, debate and that's particularly uh, fruitful? Or do you just hope that journalists will happen to find the right information? Um, we tried to replicate what WikiLeaks did with some of the cable gate releases many years ago with uh, basically reaching out to certain outlets in advance, like the Anticom server. Um, we partnered with ProPublica again to basically give them access ahead of time. They got an article ready. We had an embargo deal where we publish first, and then they can publish an hour later. Um, and so, yeah, uh, journalists, at least journalists covering the far right, are, are pretty aware of our platform, and um, uh, some of them make very good use of it. So I would say there's room for growth, but I'm satisfied with our relationship with other journalists. Yeah, and also, like, uh, I was a, an observer of this happening at first before I joined in to help develop this stuff, and you can definitely see, like, on Twitter, the like anti-fascist, anti-racist people were like very interested in this and immediately jumped on this to start helping out on their own. So, like, Unicorn Riot doesn't like isn't connected to these people, but by making this stuff public, other people jumped on it and really took it and like identified a lot of people using this and like helped break other stories. Jack, you are in. You're here. You're located here. <laughs> um, w would you would you have any um, sort of general hand wavings towards particular platforms for which this would need to be done here? Um, yeah, I'm not sure actually so much. Um, I have like a lot of my projects were U.S. based when I moved here like a while ago, and I've still been mostly connected to those. So I am like reasonably well aware of like what's going on in uh, Germany, but like not as like hyper connected deep into this stuff as I am with stuff that's happening in the US still. Um, just, uh, there are many German language Discord servers uh, that talk about things like Chemnitz. I don't speak German, uh, but there are some that I've found. And do you scrape those too? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
So <clears throat> if there are any journalists in the room, you see uh, you've got your work cut out. Um, just a couple more questions for the other two, and then it'll go to the audience. So um, Patrick uh, told us, um, a, he's made a couple of points about the dangers and benefits uh, of infiltrating, and one of the benefits was to understand and empathize with uh, some of those uh, weird figures. Um, and you said it's not a problem to actually be there's no epistemological danger. You're not going to end up agreeing with them just because you hang out with them, but you do understand them better. Are there any other tips or warnings you'd like to give? And I'll ask you the same question. There are so many. Um, I mean, there's obviously lots of, of, of very practical things, but I'm, I'm not going to go into those. Um, I used to think generally that, that infiltration is, is a good, it's just like any other like participatory uh, method, it, it's good for ex it's a good way to expose things in a nuanced way that allows us to, to understand these uh, groups. Because um, I, I think understanding uh, of, of where, where it comes from uh, helps it in stopping it. Um, and that's what you guys do as well. Um, it, it's, it's what all of us do uh, in different ways. Um, more than that, I'm, there's so much uh, that I don't know. How about you? Is this, would, you like, would you recommend that other people take on this sort of work as well, or would you say, I'd never do it again myself? Um, I mean, one of the things I completely underestimated was the security dimension of it, I think. But in general, that's something that, in the course of my work, even when I started working for the first think tank that was founded by former Islamist extremists, I, didn't, I wasn't really aware of the security dimensions that this kind of job would bring with it. So I think I would, I would not... I would carefully, I would have reservations towards recommending it um, to other people, I think because of that. But in general, I think there is a lot of value in, in infiltration and especially also when it's not concealed. But even when it's concealed, especially for exposing some of the strategies and the tactics, I think it's worth asking. Of course, you always have to use lies, distortion, manipulative means in a way and, and you do actually, yeah, make a lot of close social um, social connections, and I think misuse the trust that you get from these people. But there's also so that's the cost of it. But there, but it's also worth asking what's the cost of inaction. If then these groups may inspire lone wolves or may inspire really um, crazy uh, attacks and or sometimes even coordinate them, I think um, the cost of inaction is higher than the cost of action and. For us, or for, for, for me, I think it's one about exposing their strategies, um, giving these, um, the, the data to two journalists or two um, researchers and, and to analyze it myself, also to then feed into uh, counter-extremism programs or uh, programs that can tackle the sources or the motivations, because that's also one of the things I think, um, yeah, especially when spending so much time as you did also with them, that you really get into the deeper la layers of what actually drives them. Yeah. Um, and to predict also the trends and what their next steps are going to be, because often we're lagging behind, security agencies are lagging behind, the media is lagging behind, researchers are lagging behind. Um, so I think it's really worth getting insights into what the next steps could be to kind of predict that. Um, just one, just one note on the on the Discord service in Germany or in Europe, because I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm still, I mean, doing the the kind of online dimension of the research, and I'm in a lot of the channels, and I agree with you there. Are, a lot of um, German language channels on Discord and also in general a lot of European uh, channels, also Swedish ones now, for example, with the, the Swedish election, there's a Nordic kind of alt-right equivalent. And, but other groups, uh, for example, the Italian neo-fascists that I was observing were more, um, were using uh, Telegram rather than Discord. And other groups also have their own channels. But I think there's a lot of um, potential for work or for also for building out infrastructures for these European groups because I think it is incredibly valuable what, what you've done with the making it searchable. Just to speak about myself, I've been using it and uh, especially also when going back to 
to some of the data. I, I really, <laughs> I really sympathize with you when you were talking about the screenshots. That's basically what I've been doing um, all the time. <laughs> but also, and often you don't, I, I didn't manage to screenshot things. So then when we claim things, I think it's, it's really helpful for not being sued for libel or for being able to actually prove some of the statements that, um, yeah, that you make as a journalist or as a researcher without maybe collecting it in a systematic way, for example. Yeah. Yeah. I just add one thing. I agree with all of what you said. Um, it's it's really good. And I think um, also what's what's really important to see here in, in, in seeing where things are going is also like the process of radicalization can be mapped with kind of all our pros, our projects together. Um, so for example, I was then basically at the end of this um, uh, path in many ways, but we know that it often starts online. So. Um, we know that it starts over there, um, and then I, I vetted people. So I, I did the background checks, um, and I, I knew that people came from, from those places sometimes. And they came from and the comment threads at the end of articles. Um, and there's, there are extremely many uh, reasons for why people came into where I was. Um, but to infiltrate and, and to be part of that process, this very specific time in, in a kind of a far actors' lives when they move from the online to the offline. Um, it's, a, it's an amazing opportunity and then to be able to basically interview them because that's what background checking is. Um, and then know them when they're on the inside uh, for a while. So our methods together, I think, are incre incredibly effective tools um, to understand where this movement is going, where people are coming from radicalization um, and so on. Um, because then we also know that it's used later and, and in Charlottesville and so on, and, um, but it's, it's, it's also where it starts sometimes for them. Right, over to you guys. Um, I'm taking questions. Um, it's all men so far. Um, do you put your hand up first, go ahead. Uh, yes. uh, I have a question to, the, uh, to you guys from uh, um, Discord leaks, how do you prevent that the infrastructure that you're building is not being used and appropriated by the alt-right? Uh, because I suppose you're developing open source software, so it could probably have uh, been taken just by the opposite side and used for the same ends. Um, I mean, it's pretty simple. We don't give out the source code to this. And to be honest, it's actually not a terribly complex web app. I'm pretty sure a team of three people could recreate it in a weekend. Like. It's basically a, a small web application to display the data and a database, and we just shove stuff into it. And like, there was a little bit of complexity with like, you know, really optimizing certain features of it. But like, it's it's like uh, it's not like we built something that like we need to hide. And if the blueprint got out, everybody could recreate it. Like, you can look at it and like basically guess exactly how it was built. Okay, um, just to follow up actually Rebecca's opening comment about affect, I'm wondering if um, Patrick and Julia could speak more about the affect in the room with people. It's so easy for us to you know, say it's hate, but it's really just not hate, but it's not simply love either, right? And we could easily sort of fetishize the content and laugh at their crazy ideas, but so much is happening in the exchange of those ideas, the, the sociality, and so I'm wondering if you have any further thoughts on how the affect of the exchange of information in the room is driving people to not only believe things and express them, but keep coming. Um, yeah, I think one of the main things that, that I realized um, was the exchange of, of negative experiences or kind of just, just exchanging, um, yeah, dysphoric experiences or fears that they all had in common. And I think that really created a very close connection. And also this, then this common, this com common um, portrayal of the enemy and kind of justifying everything um, by having, uh, by agreeing on the enemy. I think that was incredibly, uh, that was quite creating quite close bonds. But, uh, and yeah, this also then leads to this victimhood narrative, which I think is, is really responsible for some of the, the really very, very trusted and close bonds that they can create. Um, 
I think there is also some, some interesting research being done on, in the field of identity fusion and how, for example, the sharing of, um, of negative experiences and fears in groups creates a dynamic that, that, is conduce, that drives radicalization. So at the University of Oxford, um, Harvey Whitehouse has, has published a lot on this. And I think the same is also happening in a way also in the online space uh, where if within those channels on, on Discord, if people share their grievances and their negative experiences with, for example, Antifa or with, um, one would maybe say, I don't know, I was attacked by Antifa, the other one say, oh yeah, I had a similar experience. I think this really creates a dynamic where um, it's, it's quite dangerous in a way because they would have a common en enemy and they would be prepared to do anything for the group to even, even to martyrdom for the whole group. And the same dynamic can also be observed, obviously, in other extremist movements, in Islamist movements, uh, ISIS, yeah, where they share also on Telegram, for example, pictures of civilians dying in the war, and then maybe someone has become the target of an anti-Muslim hate crime. So it's interesting how these negative experiences, I think, foster some of these bonds. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I think it's really central how, how this external, uh, whatever it is, uh, um, so they, they, they see themselves as uh, victims, as, as underdogs, as, um, or it depends on, on the field where you are, but either as victims or definitely suppressed in some way or another. Um, and, and to have something outside like that, to, to bond over, that, that is very much what you do, um, but you do it uh, in the social, in the social type of situations I've been in, uh, which is most of of the year, um, what you do do is, is everybody's telling the same story uh, through different means. Um, it's often a story of of having things taken from you. Uh, if, if it might be uh, practical things, uh, or it might be um, opportunities to to work and and, and so on. Um, but that theme of, of having something taken, it can also, it can also be a partner um, or a security or a feeling of security. Um, and so this is, I mean, this is told in, in so many different ways and you might not even recognize that it is the same conversation, but um, you have that over and over again. Um, and of course that, that is something that there, there's this camaraderie that comes up in, in sitting down then, and this is where the more like positive uh, things come in, uh, where people sit down around the table and they draw up an idea of what to do about it. Um, that might be more or less concrete, depending on, on how many pints into the evening you are. Um, but that, that, that's when, when the room starts to get uh, excited. Um, and you feel, uh, or people feel then, um, that they, um, they are supported, they're not one in this struggle. Um, and I think, and you also share this narrative. I mean, you share the basic idea. So to new people, um, you transfer that uh, understanding of the world uh, piece by piece, um, but relatively quickly uh, to, to new members. Um, I have two questions for Patrick. Um, first of all, does your organization, um, or do you yourself have like, did you have like some kind of program of debriefing after you uh, were no longer uh, involved with the organization and sort of like segueing back into your the quote unquote normal life? And the second question is, were you ever sort of like in a, a conflicted situation that they asked you to maybe do something, maybe also as a kind of like proof of loyalty, um, something that you, that would have caused a great uh, moral conflict for you? Um, yeah, both good questions. Uh, the first one, um, not really. Um, maybe that would have been healthy. Uh, I d don't, can't tell. Um, I mean, you are, after coming out of those things, um, you, one of the scariest kind of, um, things I, I kind of realized was that w when we then went to the journalists at, at um, the New York Times and I did a long interview with him, so that was the first interview I ever did, um, but about this as well. And I noticed that they got extremely upset um, and, and then the whole article after was about this um, extreme racism. 
and extreme anti-Semitism. That, um, like, like we see in, in everything here, it's always this exposure of the most extreme ideas, and, uh, and, and, and people find that terrifying, and they should, and it's really important that we uh, expose them in that way. I, I agree with that. But I noticed that I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't excited about it. I didn't even think that it was interesting. I didn't even tell them about it. Um, because very quickly, those things start going over your head. They just, you, you, you get used to things. Uh, and that's kind of a scary process to see it in yourself. Um, so I was in rooms where people applauded the Orlando, uh, Orlando shooting uh, quite early. Um, and that was, um, and I'm a gay person. So that was quite a difficult time and that was just right in the beginning. Um, it's kind of a claustrophobic feeling of not being able to do anything. Um, but I was in worse, the people said worse things later on, um, and I didn't react to it. Um, because that's what happens. That is the process. That is the, that's the process that everybody goes through that are on the inside. Um, it doesn't, it's not, not the same thing as radicalization. Um, it could be part of it. Um, and that's the danger of, of irony and memes as well. And we always have that process of, of um, de desensitization. Um, it's not the same thing as radicalism, but it's an important part of it. Um, so, so it does affect you. It does affect you to be on the inside, um, but you get out of it and you get other perspectives. And, and at the same time, the, I wasn't spending 100% of my time with these groups. Um, I actually did an actual education on the side. I met them many times a week, um, but I had good people around me, and I think that is central to do something like this. You need to have uh, good people around you uh, that like you for who you are. And you might not be able to talk about this, but still, it's good. Um, now, the second question. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, um, yeah, the, the, that's a common question. Um, and very little, no, um, nothing, nothing physical, absolutely not. Um, and I wouldn't have done it. It's pretty, the, the rules there are pretty clear. Uh, you wouldn't do anything against anyone. Um, you, you need to express your ideas. Uh, you need to express support for, for, for these people to, to be able to be there. But with that said, much less than you might think. Uh, people love talking about themselves and their ideas. And you get very, very, very far um, by asking uh, and just giving support by asking questions that are extremely relevant and, and, and concise. Um, but you need to say very little things overall. Um, absolutely later, you need to be able to have conversations, but there's very little um, things you need to, to, to say and do. Yeah, I have a follow-up to what he said about the desensitization, and that's something you see that the alt-right and the far-right and the Nazis all understand, and they sometimes call it red-pilling, and sometimes that's like part of the whole meme warfare thing, is like completely desensitize people to seeing like horrible language or horrible images, and then like hiding under that, like it's a joke, and then you can quickly get people over from it's a joke to no, we're actually serious. And this came out in an internal document from, I'm not positive, it's either Daily Stormer or like altright.com. Daily Stormer Style Guide? Yeah, okay, here's the Daily Stormer Style Guide had basically said this, like, you know, we never really like totally go all the way. We kind of like keep it like sarcastic and ironic and whatnot. And like, they, I don't think they explicitly say in the document that this is for radicalization, but I think they understand it at like the intellectual people who were writing this. And then other people were following along and like driving the radicalization through desensitizing like more normal folk by like using memes in certain language and whatnot. Yeah, there is this concept of controlled provocation as well, I think, where they, I mean, gen the generation identity, um, I think it's even their media guerrilla warfare that also addresses some of the points of how you push the boundaries of what's acceptable to say, this kind of Overton window, step by step, and do the red pilling, what the best topics are to start with, strategically speaking, obviously the fears that are common in, in all of us of terrorism, um, of migration to a certain extent, but picking up those kind of related fears and then going from there towards more extreme layers or more extreme ideologies, which is also, I think, why we're seeing such 
a journey sometimes of people that people sometimes make from more from actually just being just but from being in counter jihad movements kind of against Muslims against um, Islam and and against migration but move on towards then adopting conspiracy theories moving on towards the neo-nazi movements or through sometimes going through the old right towards really really extreme movements I think yeah also the networks that you exposed, that's just one of the, the additional advantages of doing infiltrations that I want to point to, because I think the, the networks that Hope Not Hate published after your infiltration were really, really helpful for some for researchers in that field and really exposing how people are connected on all the different sides and even across ideologies. There are a whole bunch of, uh, there are a whole bunch of questions left. I suggest we pool them a, so, but also if, if more than one person can, gets to ask a question, you have to keep it short. No, um, don't give counter presentations. Uh, we know you know a lot too and you're amazing people. If you could just keep your question to one or two sentences. Okay, Tatiana put up her hand first, then the gentleman with the glasses, then you, the gentleman behind you, and the person in the back. So we have five more questions. Um, I wanted to ask something to Julia and Patrick because uh, at the Disruption Lab we have been often dealing with whistleblowing and people exposing facts and misconducts. Uh, and uh, what uh, I wonder is what is the post infiltration for you also in terms of personal experience and uh, uh, the security you're dealing with uh, and uh, where you want to go next after that because of course for whistleblowers is really tough they have uh, often uh, against uh, themselves uh, nations and big powers uh, and how is for you how do you deal the, with the post of your exposure yeah um, are we collecting questions or shall I already start no okay Simply put, people radicalize to feel better, right? So extremist organizations offer something emotionally, a new family, a new narrative, victimhood, purpose, all these things. So my question would be, what can we learn from those who leave extremist organizations? Who have you encountered? Have you witnessed any, any processes, any narratives that help us understand how we can help people leave uh, extremist groups once they make a decision or what made them make a decision to leave? May I? Um, thank you all for great uh, presentations. I just have a relatively light-hearted question to Chris. Um, why um, the name is Unicorn Riot? Um, first, I'll say thank you for all your work. Um, it's very important. But I have a critical question about the technological environments that we've created with being able to network and try to influence nation-scale things and global-scale things now with the tools. And it's interesting to note from the first session, we saw that the, the left uh, was, was being co-opted by the right. And there's a little bit of an example here, unfortunately, that the, right, the, the left is co-opting the, the right. If you see that using spy mechanisms, surveillance mechanisms um, to, to capture from, from, from the, the alt-right some information. So there's a bit of a surveillance factor there. And so do you, what do you see as, a, as a, like the positive direction of the, the technological communications that have really made a mess of our society? question um, about the post kind of infiltration um, environment or what it feels like afterwards. I think, uh, luck I, I mean, I did know, of course, that there was an exp expiry date to all of this, especially offline. I think it's still possible to do um, some online infiltrations. But luckily, I'm not a whistleblower that's up against state actors. So I think it is still, there's still quite a big difference whether uh, you have 
kind of uh, whether someone on the state level sees you as an enemy or whether it's non-state actors that actually don't have the same capabilities. But having said that, of course, it was, I think, in the aftermath, um, some of the waves of the threats and, and uh, the harassment were quite, on a psychological level, quite difficult to cope with. I think, yeah, it, it was really helpful to then sometimes just shut off social media to kind of do a detox from social media and, and also to have a really good social environment that would help me to, to get through that phase. But I think, Patrick, you, you probably also um, have even more extreme examples of, of how yeah, the old right dealt with that. Uh, just a few words on, shall I also, just a few words on, the, on, on what we can learn from um, people who exit, who are at least the people that I've kind of come across. I think a lot of the reasons often were, um, or at least some of the people that left after being exposed or after the strategies, the extreme strategies were exposed, um, there was also a recent example of the Generation Identity UK leader, leader leaving after it became clear that one of the people within Generation Identity who I also met had links to a Norwegian neo-Nazi group. And um, often it is about disillusionment um, or kind of revelations about uh, other members that they would be really close to or leaders of the organization. It seems, I, I, I think that's also one, another value of infiltrations that you can expose some of the really extreme links and then actually trigger that process of where they think, oh, maybe actually those are also the bad guys in a way. But also, on the other hand, also positive uh, experiences with the perceived enemy. I feel like that often came up as well. Um, talking to formers, I think having a surprise experience with someone that they perceived as an enemy, um, a po surprisingly positive uh, experience, that often triggered at least something, but obviously that's not the whole, that, that doesn't bring them out of, of the movements yet. Um, but yeah, recreating a good social environment where, because their movements become family replacements, I think is, is also really important. Um, yeah, I, I think um, life after um, right now is pretty good to be out, I must say. Um, but I, I think the hate you receive is it, a very gendered thing, online hate. Uh, it works very differently, I think. Um, um, I think what I received is probably much less than you, actually. Um, I get pointed out for being a race traitor, which is fine. Uh, and it doesn't feel very, it's not very direct and concrete. Um, it's, that's how I take it, at least. It's such an absurd thing. And it's also, um, it, it, for me, that's quite easy to deal with. Um, but that's how I work. I mean, everybody works differently. Um, but it's not very direct. Um, it's very, it's a very absurd idea. Um, then I, th there has been threats, like more direct threats from, from some of these um, people that I kind of know about uh, in London and stuff, so I am aware of where I go, uh, but that's about it. And then about what gets people out, um, yeah, I agree with all those things. I think really um, when you expose, like, or they kind of see um, something that they really dislike in you, it's like something really extreme. We have an example recently um, where, uh, where person, I couldn't tell the details now because I don't think I'm allowed, um, a person saw um, basically members of the organization planning to do something extreme, like very extreme, uh, violent attacks. So they decided, they, they see kind of the truth behind things. This is what it is. Uh, and then they say, this is clearly immoral. I don't want to be a part of this. So that, that's happened. Um, really, um, also just this a possibility of a life outside of it. Um, that you have built up connections with other people outside that might be a coincidence or it might kind of have happened in any different sort of way. Um, because it, it costs a lot to be in these groups. It does cost a lot. You, you lose uh, a lot of things, possible careers and all sorts of things. Um, and then sometimes, which I hope for and, and that's happened, I know some cases, and it's um, about when we do what we did now, we uh, kind of cut the heads of the organization. So we, we, we realized that Stead Stedman is a, a very dangerous person and he leaves this organization. By taking him out, the organization will stop working. Then you open up this kind of vacuum. Um, before you had this very tight group. Um, 
now you don't have these events anymore because there is also so much distrust. So then there's also the possibility to turn to other things outside. So it's kind of an extension of the first one. Uh, about the last one, um, I don't know if it was directed to me or, or uh, I guess it is. Um, of course, there is a danger uh, in that. Um, that's why I really think people should think twice uh, about infiltration. It's, it's, it's really a method that should be used when, when it has to. Um, and you need to take it into account of everything around it. Um, then about wider technologies, um, I don't think I have time to talk about those things. Um, but anti-fascism needs to be contextual. Um, we need to react to and prevent as well. Um, but anti-fascism has always been contextual. Um, the response and, and the way we conduct anti-fascism look, has looked different uh, in the last uh, many, many decades. Um, and it's because the threat has changed. Uh, and sometimes, um, nowadays, it's, they really make use of the anonymous fact, uh, possibility to be anonymous. So that's why those things are very useful now. Um, and it might look differently. You know, wow, it definitely looks different now than it did 10 years ago. Um, and I think right now this is some of the most effective methods, but they should always be used with, with caution. So I'm going to answer the, the third question. And it, the question was, you know, like, it sounded like, is the left co-opting the spycraft of the right and implicating it because, you know, typically governments and especially spy agencies tend to be further right than maybe the nation itself. And the implication of that question would be that the left is now co-opting a bad thing that the right does in order to fight the right. And I think that's like, if that's how the question was phrased, I would find that like kind of reductive and like also ignores the historical context of how like anti-fascism actually works. And so like if you think of like a physical war a lot of times, you imagine is there's a border and then the tanks roll across the border and the war was not started and then it started when they crossed the border. And that's not really how fascism and anti-fascism fight it out. And if you look at how fascism rose in either Italy or Germany, it started off with you know some bad ideas and some small groups and the groups grew. Then the groups got into street fights and then some laws were enacted, some of them got into it. And it's like this very slow process. And it's kind of hard to say where was the line where it was went from no fascism to yes fascism and like Maybe you say that's when, like, you know, Hitler was made chancellor, or maybe after he like implement, implemented the like draconian laws and whatnot, they gave himself more power. And like, it's not actually that simple. And so, if we like, this is a bit of an exaggeration, but also it's not as much as people really think, because like we are in a very similar state now to how we were in like 1930s, like Italy or Germany, that we see the rise of fascism and people are fighting it. And I don't. Th think that there's any methods that are totally off limits. Like, I'm not gonna say, like, definitely please don't go like blow up schools or any shit like that. Like, but spycraft is a very legitimate tool to be used to be fighting the far right. And like, I think the, in this case, you definitely say the ends justify the means, even if like in general, we don't like surveillance as you know, the left and in general, we don't like policing or cops or the idea of like a national body enforcing laws or whatnot. But I do think that spycraft right now is very helpful to us. I think Chris has some thoughts on this too. Um, yeah, so the implications of like technological surveillance with the Discord leaks, um, it's something I've given a lot of thought to. I, um, I'm not really a tech expert or anything, but when the Snowden leaks happened, I was, I was very interested. I tried to read all the stories and documents that I could, and um, so I like to think I have like an amateur knowledge level on this stuff. Um, and one of the first things when I started asking Discord for comment when I was writing some of the first articles, because um, they would say, you know, if you find this and report this to us, we'll shut it down. But because of our privacy policy, we're not going to go finding the Nazi chats to delete them. And I was like, it's like, oh, but you could, and you're just not. And it's like, well, but why don't you just enable end-to-end -end encryption on your platform, and then you have like a total perfect excuse, and you also strengthen uh, privacy globally. Um, and Discord has a feature request for end-to-end -end encryption, and they've officially said they're not interested in it. So that's just a, a little side note, I guess. Um, I guess I, I think the Discord stuff is basically open source intelligence. It's a little bit like maybe you have to get into the part of the web where these chats are. Like it's not totally, like you can't just Google it and find it usually, but I, I think it's basically open source intelligence and I think that's sort of um, just a neutral tool observation um, and sort of, uh, I think, um, 
I don't think journalists should do law enforcement's job, and we didn't want to be doing what um, a lot of groups that compile this information uh, aren't necessarily journalists like us. Like the main groups in the United States would be like the Southern Poverty Law Center and the Anti Defamation League. And basically, their whole program is just to collect information and send it to law enforcement, um, who often uh, does nothing with it or has uh, officers who are members of, of some of these groups. So uh, we thought making the information available to the public was like the, the most ethical way to, to do it as journalists. Um, the name Unicorn Riot, uh, it was sort of, we, when we were making our group, there was a lot of different conversations. and. Uh, we just threw random words together. That was the only one that we all didn't hate. Um, <laughs> it's a little goofy. You know, sometimes I, we sort of think about it and we're like, yeah, this is definitely our name now. Uh, <laughs> but so the, the story I like to tell, we get asked this question a lot. A lot of right-wing comments on our YouTube are like, oh, I, I can't take you seriously with a name like Unicorn Riot. And it's like, you might not take us seriously, but you will remember the name. Sorry, I have like, so going back to the other question, do you have one more thing to add about like, right wing more government sanctioned spying versus like left wing more individual like small organization spying is the idea of state versus non-state actors is like extremely muddy like we're living in some weird like cyberpunk future where corporations have more power than governments a lot and like borders exist in the sense that sometimes you need a password to cross them but like borders of information really don't exist which is why we see the right and the left like having very much international solidarity in certain ways and so like it's also weird that t countering this non-governmental, extremely powerful entity does require lots of different ways. And so like when you said that you don't feel like you're worried about state actor, like if I was going up against the far right and like really pissing them off, I would be like equally as worried as about pissing off whatever the government of the nation I was living in because like the far right in general does have more power than some small nations in like some senses of like, and that's like, a very bizarre thing we have to deal with like in the modern world. Yeah, anyways. Yeah, th thank you all so much. We, uh, we could continue, and we will continue this discussion. It's, um, I'm, I'm afraid we have to come to a stop for, for now on this platform, but I'm sure we'll hang out and you'll hang out and can get rid of some of your questions. Thank you so much for your work, for your presentations, for answering all our questions, or some of them. And thank you for Titania and her team for doing this amazing event. Uh, it's, it's, it's amazingly organized, fabulous people. I loved it. Um, and Tatiana has the last word, and um, pray stay with us for another couple of minutes while she um, tells us about the event and the future. But first, let's yes. So I also wanted to thank you a lot, and uh, I, since now I just steal three minutes of your time, yeah, I can also tell you to go relaxing because <laughs> you have been on stage a lot. I just wanted to announce what is going to happen next, not today because we are quite uh, tired. Um, so we are planning to meet again tomorrow at Spectrum at uh, 7.30. Uh, we will have again Daryl Davis with us that will do a piano performance, so don't miss that. And we will show the film Accidental Courtesy, Daryl Davis, Race in America, that is telling the story of uh, Daryl Davis befriending the members of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, so uh, this will be at Spectrum, so not here, but in the Spectrum space, uh, since we are having a great collaboration here, Lika is sitting. <laughs> and um, also I wanted to um, conclude uh, the series of our events, that I say this was the second event, so, uh, the first one was Hate News that we did in May, so I can also suggest you to go to check our videos. Um, and uh, as we usually do when we uh, come to an end, but hopefully it's not an end because we are planning new events also for next year, but this will be the last event of this year, so it's a big moment. I want to uh, thank deeply uh, the members of my team and also I want to ask them to come here on stage, so I call them, uh, Kim Foss, Nada Bakker, and Ryle Verer, the project managers of the Disruption Network Club, please come here with me.
And then I also want to thank a lot to Jonas Franke that is already on stage with us. Sorry, we don't have the flower for you, but uh, <laughs> we have a lot of love and appreciation for your wonderful graphic and <laughs> communication help, uh, technology, all the things that you constantly do. And also I have to say moral support for myself for uh, dealing with all these topics that you know, are tough also for people that organize these things. So thank you, Jonas. And then I want to thank a lot also the other people that are always with us during the event. Uh, first, uh, Elisabeth Enke, that is over there, our sound technician. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And Maria Silvano, the, our wonderful photographer. And the super video documentation team, the Rothso film, film crew, that have been documenting. And also the streaming that we finally had after a really long time of, uh, you know, willing to have it, finally we managed. Uh, the Boiling Head Media. And finally, I want to thank Katia at the cash desk, our technical support, uh, uh, Thorsten, and also all the helpers that are always building up and taking down the space. That is a lot of work as well. So thank you very much for being here. Now we can all finally relax and uh, we will meet tomorrow again at 7 30 please come to watch the film that is also a really important conclusion of our event and uh, yeah do you want to say something no <laughs> okay <laughs> so ah we also want to thank you very much because i think it was a great program and also a great audience and i have to say i really enjoyed the last two days so, yeah, thank you for making this possible. <laughs>